Good afternoon. Welcome to the workshop titled Lessons Learned from Life in Primary School, Science and Practice. My name is Viktor Sosin. I will be serving as the moderator today. You will be hearing a presentation from Professor Dominic Weiss, but before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. Today's session is being recorded to be available for viewing post-conference. If you have any questions to the presenter, please use the chat feature in the NIS conference mobile application. The speaker today will have about uh, 25 minutes for the presentation. We plan to have about 10 minutes for questions and expect to finish the session by um, 16.30. We will hold questions until the end of the session and I will then read them out loud for the presenter to answer as time permits. Now moving along to our session, our speaker today, Professor Dominic Weiss, the Professor of Early Childhood and Primary Education at the UCL Institute of Education. He's president of the British Educational Research Association and the founding director of the Helen Hamlin Center for Pedagogy. Please welcome Professor Dominic Weiss. Sorting out my screen share with you now. Could you please uh, show please. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you. So it's a real pleasure to talk to you all today. Um, and I'm going to talk about primary education because that's my specialism. But I'm also going to talk about research because that is also my specialism. And in particular, I'm going to talk about what I call close to practice research. Um, in essence, it means um, the close relationship between teaching, learning, working in primary schools and research. And sometimes that research is research that we read and then we put into practice in our classrooms. Sometimes that's research that we do as teachers working together with researchers. <clears throat> and so today I'm going to take you briefly through my career <laughs> in 20 minutes, a bit of a challenge. I'm going to start in a school that I taught in as a teacher. I was a primary school teacher. And I'm then going to explain how I uh, got interested in research and my first research project. I'm going to then show you how that first research project <clears throat> um, resulted eventually, I suppose, in me being a professor in a university like University College London Institute of Education, uh, and indeed being president of the British Educational Research Association. So I hope you can see this grainy photograph, black and white photograph. This is London, and it's a part of London near two mainline railway stations. More particularly, the area is called Summers Town. I can show you in a modern Google map, um, you can see where my first primary school that I taught in is in London. And it's a deprived area in London. It was very deprived. It still is, has lots of families who are economically poor. Having said that, in the 20 years or so, things have changed enormously in that part of London. A huge amount of new buildings have gone on, especially near the big station you can see on the bottom left of the, photo, of the image. That's a London King's Cross railway station. And at the, the top right corner of the image, you can see, uh, I think that one, sorry, the one on the bottom left is London Euston, and the one on the top right is London King's Cross. So that's where I started my primary school teaching career. Now, I studied uh, my postgraduate teaching certificate 
after my degree actually in music at uh, Goldsmiths uh, University, which is part of London University. Uh, and I got very interested in how children learn to write. And in my view, literacy is a very, very important part of what, what children learn in their education. Now, of course, I'm talking today about literacy in the English language. I'm afraid I, I don't know very much uh, at all about writing in uh, Russian or Kazakh. So apologies. Um, I'll let you work out the links. <clears throat> and so, of course, teaching is um, about um, what approaches shall we use to, to be effective as a teacher? And the teaching of writing obviously has attracted research. But when I started teaching, there wasn't nearly as much research about the teaching of writing as there is now. But I did come across uh, an inspirational writer whose name was Donald Graves. And Donald Graves wrote a book that became popular in some English dominant countries. Uh, and Donald Graves said, all sorts of things about how writing should be taught. And you can see in the paragraph on the screen that um, Graves said that essentially, um, he called it the process approach to writing. And this, I will summarize quickly, is a way of teaching children to write where you emulate a publishing cycle in the classroom. So children become authors in the classroom. They make choices about their writing and, and how to write and what to write. That's quite different from the more traditional, give the children a writing task. And it's much more diff different from give the children an exercise, for example, in learning grammatical terms. So the process approach to writing focuses on the processes that real writing is how it's done, basically. And you can see the quote that I've put in bold there. Writers who do not learn to choose topics wisely lose out on the strong link between voice and subject. That means the writers, the voice of the writer, that's their style, if you like, their ability to construct sentences and the subject they're writing about. Now, Graves was at the time working in a university um, in uh, New Zealand, as I recall. Um, I'm sure it may have been the, the USA, I forget which at the moment. Um, and he had done some research that was related to his book, but he came under criticism for his research. I think this is not uncommon when somebody has a very popular idea. It's bound to attract some criticism. This was a, another researcher called Peter Smagorinsky who criticized <coughs> Graves quite strongly. Um, for example, Smagorinsky says Graves' approach to teaching writing was unstructured expression of personal experiences. Smagorinsky is critical about case study research. He's critical <clears throat> about the scale of the research. But worst of all, um, Smagorinsky says it's not even research at all. He calls it reportage. And that really is quite damning if not rude. <laughs> um, now, criticism, sorry, critique, which is a bit different from criticism, critique in research is normal, and we need to have good debates about research, but it, it needs to be respectful as well. <clears throat> and so, uh, but, but this is, for, for those of you who know a lot about research, 
This is a, um, a very common argument, actually. It's about people who feel that quantitative studies, experimental trials, for example, um, are what's needed to judge whether, whether a teaching approach is effective. And other people who prefer qualitative research will argue um, that, that actually qualitative research gives us insights that you can't get from experimental designs. The debate still going on, and I, I, you know, I think it's a debate that needs to move on. <clears throat> and just so you get a, a, a real sense of children, because I'm, you know, I'm talking about research today, and I'm talking about teaching, and I'm talking about prof teachers as professionals. But at the, at, the, at the end of the day, there are children whose lives can be positively or negatively affected by how good their teaching is. And so this child <clears throat> did this piece of writing when I was a teacher and I taught this child and I, I did writing workshops every week um, following Graves's method. And I have to say the, the children's writing was transformed Actually, more, more than that, their attitude to writing was transformed. So when I set up writing tasks, and I was really interested, and I tried to prepare them really well, I tried to make the tasks exciting, the children were not very motivated. But when I did the writing workshop approach, they were much more motivated. Now... Um, so this is a child who was probably about seven years old, and he uh, wrote a story. In fact, it was like a mini, almost a mini novel, a mini saga. On the left side of this page, you can see it says, to my mum and dad. So this child had a real audience in mind, and that's important because audiences for writers write for audiences, both known and unknown. And this child has created an epic scene. Romans, there's a battle. There, the child has created a new race of people called the Hojibs. They, they're not real, they're, they're made up. And very sadly, as the child says, one of the Romans is killed with an arrow through the head. And then at the bottom of the picture, you see a, a beautiful illustration of a grave. Really, that, that illustration connects to the composition of the writing. It's not a separate thing. This child is doing very sophisticated things for, for a child of that age with writing. By the way, the child also needs to improve their spelling, improve their punctuation. But these are developmental things that with the right teaching will also improve. But you have to focus first and foremost on the composition and the ideas, in my view. And so um, a first research project, my interest as a teacher became an interest uh, as a researcher. And I did a master's degree where I studied teachers uh, actually in another school I was teaching in. I worked with three teachers. So it was in-depth qualitative inquiry. I produced my first book. That's unusual for a master's degree. Um, I was proud of it at the time. I'm still proud of it, but I would write it differently now, of course. And so let's jump forward to um, let's jump forward to the research evidence that we have now. And this is where I've now put my research and my professor hat firmly on my head. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, this is on the basis of 20 years of a career and knowledge. Um, and so Peter Smagorinsky, who you remember, criticised 
Donald Graves' research for being small scale. Uh, and fair enough, it was small scale, but of course, really good qualitative research should break new ground, should test new ideas, which can then be tested through efficacy trials and maybe one day through larger scale randomized controlled trials. Well, in a way, that's what's happened with research on the teaching of writing. Um, <clears throat> so what I've done here, and it was published in a peer reviewed research paper, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. What I did with Carol Torgerson, my, my co-author, was to say, well, what do we know from multiple um, research studies, multiple randomized control trials? I'm grateful also to Steve Graham's work for informing this. And so these are seven things that we know in terms of writing in the English language, and I'm sure some of them will apply to other languages as well. <clears throat> in fact, I'm aware that Steve Graham has recently done some work on the Turkish language. So we know that if you increase the amount of time spent writing, this means not, I, I think, not just writing exercises, but actually writing. So how often, ask yourselves, how often do children in schools get the opportunity to compose texts, full texts, not just do exercises? <clears throat> And you can see the EF, the effect size, is uh, a medium effect size for time. <clears throat> uh, the, the emphasis on the process of writing is a larger effect size. So what this means is Donald Graves was correct. The, pro the process approach to writing, or emphasizing the processes of writing, has resulted in effect sizes of 0.48, across, that's a pulled effect size, across multiple studies. By the way, some people will argue that's worth about three months extra progress, at least three months extra progress for, uh, on average, for the children's uh, development in writing. <clears throat> in a bit more detail about the studies, uh, in this table that you can see here. So um, for process writing in, in general, um, when we wrote this paper, there were 33 studies that had been found. Uh, so it's 33 experimental trials. Um, and you can see that this divides up into elementary or primary schools versus secondary schools. Uh, and in primary schools, the effect size is larger. That's the 0.48 effect size, larger even than secondary where it's 0.25. And so we can say with uh, some confidence, uh, well, of course, the actual confidence intervals are there, uh, that, um, this is an approach that works. And so to finish my uh, talk in this workshop today, this is my last slide, um, I just want to connect this, what I've said with some, some other things. I've given you a quick view of how I, my career took me from primary school teaching into research and particularly research about writing and literacy. Um, I know that I'm very uh, honored that my book, Becoming a Primary Teacher, has been translated into Russian, I believe, and possibly Kazakh as well. Um, funnily enough, I only found out a year or so ago, but it was a nice surprise. And that book is um, was designed not to be a heavy research book at all. It was designed for people, I wrote it eight years ago, for people who were thinking of becoming a teacher. And so it tried to just, in a, in a relatively 
informal way, raise some of the issues that teachers face. Um, and I've also, I'm currently working on um, some new additions. Reflective teaching in the primary school was not originally my book. I've actually been invited by the original lead author to be part of that new, new uh, edition. Teaching English Language and Literacy is um, my book, and it's been very popular. Uh, it was, the first edition was 2001, um, and I'm now waiting to hear about some uh, reviews of proposals for a fifth edition. And so you can see that in just in those few examples of my books, I'm interested in research, but I'm also interested in how does research translate into uh, practice in the classrooms? And in fact, how does it impact on children? Um, as Bearer President, so that's the British Educational Research Association, I'm president, um, I will be president until September 2022. Um, so I, have, I will have been president for three years. Um, and I've been leading work on what we call close to practice research. And there are some publications. We, we've done a research project and we've published in the British Educational Research Journal about close to practice research. And in fact, there is a fiery debate coming soon. Um, it's already been published digitally and soon will be in hard copy in the British Journal of Education, uh, the British Educational Research Journal, all about the close to practice debate. Um, and you can see that I've made a link there to that debate, um, which you can follow up. Um, and I'm also finally, for me, um, this the debate is not just about teaching, which is really important. It's not just about research, which is really important. It's actually about education in universities. So um, we have I have done some workshops with colleagues in Russia where we've been working with early career researchers to look at academic writing. Uh, and that, that was fascinating. It's maybe something that we can do with you in, in Kazakhstan. Um, now, the, the link to the blog there tells you about why I think um, why I think close to practice research is related to how we think about education as a, an academic discipline. Anyway, I'm going to stop there and thank you for listening. I um, hope I've, you've been able to think about some questions which I'll be uh, happy to address. And I'll stop sharing uh, my screen if I can find the way of doing that. Uh, yes, dear audience, if you have questions for Professor Dominic Weiss, please add them in the chat and we'll be able to answer some of them. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Weiss, for addressing yeah. this interesting topic. Um, I highlighted three aspects uh, of that. Uh, first of all, thank you for such a reflective and deeply reflexive uh, sharing of your uh, personal story of becoming a researcher uh, while initially being a, a teacher. Uh, I think I, I find it very inspiring. I think um, okay. some audience, uh, many, many teacher practitioners will watch us and I think it also will be interesting and it was very inspiring for them. The second, um, I heard and, and hearing about uh, this moment, exciting moment of transformation by a book which influenced your academia inquiry yeah. immensely, yes. Uh, I thought such experience might be uh, that teachers who seek the opportunities for development usually have. So this experience might be shared with our audience as well. And yeah. the third one, uh, the way how the area of research around the development of writing skills uh, enriched and developed through time, it also strikes me. Uh, I think that it, it inclined me to think that every piece of research is some kind of agent of change into acad in the academia world. So yeah. yes, thank you for such insights. Um, 
My pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. We, I have some questions for you. Uh, you mentioned the book by Donald Graves. Donald Graves claimed that providing the choice to children in writing might lead to a better development of skills, according to his quote. Yeah. And uh, you may, uh, and uh, could you please tell more about that? I mean, the influence of choice to the, the development of skills. Could you please elaborate on that more? Yes. And what's your personal attitude to the choice uh, in writing, in uh, development writing? Yeah. Yes. Interesting you should pick that one up. It's a very good point to pick up, I think. Um, so funnily enough, the very specific idea of children making choices, for example, over the topic of their writing, or even the style to some degree, the genre, we might say, to my knowledge actually has not been subject to experimental trial. So there are all sorts of aspects of Donald Graves's approach that have been. Um, of course, it's not common for researchers to say, we are going to test the Donald Graves approach. It's more that they say, we're going to test whether um, doing drafts of writing, which is not common in English dominant nations. It's not common for children. It's more frequent for them to do one copy of writing and then leave it or do a piece of writing and then edit it only for spelling and punctuation, not to compose and then redraft or revise. So, um, so in other words, the research shows that the emphasis on processes, not just products or not just spelling or not just is important. But I think on the question of um, the choice, as I say, I don't think that that single thing we know either way. Um, I do have a PhD student at the moment who is actually going to do a small scale um, trial uh, to to examine that very question, actually. So I'll tell you in a couple of years. <laughs> okay. um, oh. Sorry, was there another part to that question? I've forgotten. Uh, what's your personal attitude to choice? I mean... Um... Ah, yeah, right. Now, of course, choice is not only a matter of research. And this is where we... we, we, we we, we come to the question of values and democracy so and empowerment. And in fact, I will use the word agency, student agency, pupil agency, children's agency. In other words, what, what I have defined in my research as the socially situated capacity to act. Uh, now, agents, some people will say children should be be encouraged and allowed to make choices in their education. And writing is just a small area where sometimes choice can be offered. I should say, I don't, I'm not advocating choice all the time. I'm saying there needs to be a balance, it seems to me, between often the teacher will make the choice on behalf of the pupil, but sometimes pupils um, <coughs> should choose. I'll also add that I think in my experience, it's very common for teachers to direct children to say, I want you to do this task on spelling and I want you to do this task on grammar and I want you to do, and very, very rarely do children get the chance even to compose whole texts of writing for themselves. For example, to be published in the classroom and of course, digital formats give lots of um, opportunity for children to, to, to publish uh, in, in imaginative ways. So I think there is um, a moral, a moral obligation as well as a, you know, even if the research picture is undecided, there is a moral obligation, I think, as well, to offer children choices sometimes. Uh, and by the way, if you think this isn't possible in a national curriculum, for example, then you only need to look at Scotland, in the UK, Scotland's curriculum for excellence, where children making choices is an explicit requirement in that national curriculum. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question will be about uh, the debate uh, which you mentioned uh, between sort of a qualitative and quantitative research, yes. which is uh, common. <laughs> and probably um, for our teacher practitioners who uh, conduct their research in school settings, that might be quite a complicated concept because it is based on sort of epistemology and ontology of research. Yeah. And uh, I was also in the situations when I heard teachers who shared their um, stories when they conducted, for example, small scale qualitative research. Uh, and in spite of the depths of the exploration, they met criticism yes, from, from other people, uh, like yeah. because there were only, for example, two or three students involved. Yeah. And could you please uh, share your um, advice or, and your opinion with our teachers uh, yeah. who uh, conduct uh, some um, kind of action research in school settings uh, in terms of probably validity of the research? Yes, yeah. Good. Very, very good question indeed. Um, so the main thing I would say is teachers who do research let's say, action research, um, or it's important they are realistic about the scale of that research. So um, it, it's, it's important research, I mean, because we do research for different reasons. So a teacher or a team of teachers may say, right, we've, we've noticed this issue or this problem and we want to think about that problem more deeply. And so we'll do some research. Now, ideally, if that research could be in partnership with, you know, a researcher in a university, that's, I think, a very good uh, collaboration because the researcher will bring knowledge about epistemology and ontology, if you like, but the teachers have their, their knowledge that the researcher does not have, which is about practice on the ground. And so what, what, what you teachers should not do is overgeneralize. We cannot overgeneralize from small scale studies, but we can say important things. And so some small scale studies do uncover new findings, which sometimes researchers will say, right, well, I want to do a, a larger scale investigation of, of that idea. And the teachers could also get involved like that. Um, but, but I think really the more important thing is research, as I've shown you, research is a, is a way, it's a journey. It's research is a way to learn, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, you know, I'm reasonably good at research now, but there's lots of things I still don't understand or know. And I, I consult with other colleagues to help me. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I work my research projects. In fact, I'm just finishing, I've just submitted the final report for peer review of a study that's taken three years on whether the teaching of grammar in English helps ch uh, seven-year-old children to learn to write better. And that was a randomized controlled trial and uh, a process, of, a qualitative process evaluation. So for the teachers in the audience, I, th I would say get involved with research. Um, you don't have to do it yourself, but if you want to, then you need to I think learn a little bit about research methods because it's methods where the debates are held. Uh, teachers are often, in my experience, very good at thinking about the, the topic of the research and naturally less good at thinking about the research methods. But you have to think about research methods to make sure your research is good research and even if it's small scale, that's okay. You just don't overgeneralize. You say, I can say this about my research and that's all I can say, but that's still worth saying. Uh, and just finally on this question, um, two things. One is 
if you read some of the things I've published about close to practice research, you will see these issues are there in these papers and blogs and, and things. But on the issue of co- the, the, the idea that we have qualitative on one hand and quantitative on another hand, it's an old debate. To be honest, we should have moved beyond. Uh, and what, what, what the, where we are is every research design has its strengths and weaknesses. Randomized controlled trials are full of choices to be made in terms of the methods, the, the measurement tools, uh, the statistics. So in that way, many similarities with qualitative research where choices are made about the methods, the analyses, and so on. And so um, we, I think it, we need to get away from this either or, you know, this what I would call a binary opposition. Uh, I have, in fact, you know, myself and my editors of the uh, SAGE the Beer Sage Handbook on Educational Research have done a 10,000 word introduction, which talks about some of these issues as well. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yes, yes I, I really liked your comparison of research to a journey. I think that's how teachers, mm-hmm. I think, yeah. might uh, look at that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. An- another question is, uh, at the least, of uh, findings from um, this systematic review. Yeah. I've noticed uh, this um, point that uh, you uh, typing and handwriting both to be taught. <laughs> That's an interesting um, tendency. Yes, you know, uh, in Finland, it's one of the countries that stopped uh, making handwriting classes compulsory and moved towards typing skills. Could you please tell about this tendency globally and uh, what might be the future of that tendency? Because this is very unusual concept for Kazakhstani teachers, particularly in primary schools. So are you saying that in uh, primary schools, handwriting is taught or computer keyboard skills? <clears throat> yes, I mean, uh, like a provocative a bit. Uh, will. Uh, Mm. Will we have some 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 time mm, typing classes instead of handwriting classes? Ah, okay, yeah, okay. The um, so the the research evidence it shows that um, that you if you teach keyboard uh, skills that can have a benefit on pupils' writing. But there are also studies that show that if you teach handwriting, that can have a benefit on children's writing. As far as I remember, the research on handwriting is, there are more studies on handwriting, I think, than on keyboard use. But overall, um, we concluded that, in fact, Steve Graham really as well concluded that you, you could and probably should teach some keyboard use. Um, I mean, not least because um, we use keyboards so much in, um, you know, in adult workplaces and so on. Now, I'm, funnily enough, was just asked to comment on a Guardian newspaper story about um, whether we should teach what we call cursive handwriting, which, or joined up handwriting, where you join the letters in the English language. Um, and there's no evidence to suggest that that, that makes any difference. The, the, the real, the, in cognitive terms, the main issue is children need to become fluent. And to become fluent, you have to be able to either form the letters quickly to make the words, or and or use the keyboard efficiently. Uh, And so um, I'm not, I don't know when the best age, by the way, I don't know when the best age is to teach. I'm sure uh, probably later primary school rather than early for keyboard, because it seems to me the children have to understand to form the letters by hand. Uh, Of course, the keyboard style of letters is rather different in English, certainly from 
from the handwritten formation, but they need both, I think. So, but the main message for teachers today is do, um, do some teaching of things like handwriting, and it will actually help the composition of writing because it frees up. Um, it's about executive function in the end, and it frees up memory space, uh, short-term memory space, to allow the children to compose more fluently. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left, so my last question will be uh, is connected uh, to the book which transformed uh, your thinking. Mm, and is it possible, could you please share some examples of books which you think might also transform the view of our teachers into their profession, into pedagogy? <laughs> Well, I, I mustn't say any of my books, of course. That would be uh, <laughs> um, interesting. Um, I think the world, the world has changed. Um, and I'm, I'm sad to say that I think the book, like Donald Graves' book, is perhaps um, not quite as significant for teachers as it used to be? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know the answer to this, actually. Um, I'm recently, um, one of the things I'm working on in England is a, a commission to look at, it's actually um, secondary education first. We're going to look at primary education later, but it's about how do you assess pupils? Um, and uh, there are key authors who have, are popular authors, you know. So uh, most academics, of course, um, are they do their research and it goes into peer-reviewed research journal papers and sometimes into academic books. And in universities, that's the way we are encouraged to work. And so it's less common for um, academics to write books for teachers, for example. I do, um, because I've always felt that being close to practice is important. And so uh, I, I suppose, uh, forgive me for talking about my own work, but the, the book that I mentioned called Reflective Teaching, in, well, it's not my book yet. So Andrew Pollard, um, who, is a primary education specialist uh, in the UK. He first came up with the idea of this, you know, reflective teaching in primary schools. Um, uh, and I'm going to be working on a new version for primary, for primary school teachers. Um, um, it's been a very, very popular book in the UK. Um, and I think it does have it's the research that it covers is relevant, I'm sure, to other countries. It's just that its typical market is for um, primary school teachers in, in the UK. And that is an important point, actually. Um, perhaps the reason that my book, the book that was translated into Kazakh and, and Russian, I think, perhaps the reason that got translated is it was written in a way in plain language. And it was written about um, topics that could translate into other countries. Um, and that's really hard actually to do because education is increasingly about policy, isn't it? It's about the policies in, in like in your country, you will have policies that the government to some degree insists on and, um, and that's a cultural context. So um, it's quite hard for me to, beyond that to recommend particular books um okay. okay yes thank you uh thank you for such fruitful conversation it was uh, a pleasure to be the moderator today uh, thank you again for this workshop today and thank you all the attendees this sessions this session please be sure to visit next session of the conference which starts at 16 30 day first recap enjoy the rest of the mas conference goodbye thank you uh, Professor Weiss. Thank you, and I um, look forward to doing the keynote talk tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.